Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Fear Group webinar. I am your co-host, the one that matters, Adam V. Russo Esquire, the CEO and co-founder of this amazing company. We are so happy that all of you are here to join us today. Guys, it is beautiful outside, isn't it? <laughs> we have 60 degrees, cloudy, rain. It is, what day is today? June what? June 20th. June 20th. June 20th, and this is the weather we get. Folks, I, I think I've used my pool five times this year. Now, for our friends in Dallas and our friends in Texas, you know, they tell us they have the year, their pools open year-round, and they have to turn the heaters on, like, in January for, like, a month or so. You know, we need our heaters on here in July. Literally, you do. <laughs> oh, yeah. My heater was on two days ago to use the pool. We had the heater on in June, Ron. It's crazy. I'm crying for you right now, Adam. <laughs> Anyways, folks, we are so happy with the hundreds and thousands of you that are going to be listening to our webinar today. We're very excited about it. Today's webinar is going to be about the impact of state, federal laws, and current market trends on self-funding. If people don't like this webinar, it's pretty simple. Blame Brady. Brady put these slides together. Is this the first time Brady put all the slides together, Ron? You know this is his uh, independent project. He did a good job. This is the first and maybe only time Brady will ever put slides together for a webinar. But today is very special for another reason. It is an interactive webinar. What? Yes, Ron. <laughs> we are making this webinar interactive, meaning we have listed, I think, four questions, right, three normal ones and one easy one, right, one fun one. Yeah, one layup. That we will ask you, and you'll be able to answer, I don't know how exactly, but we'll figure that out. You'll be able to answer it on your computer, okay? Matt Payton, who's our, what is he, our marketing, client account manager, social all media, that, social marketing media, guru. He designed it all, so if it doesn't go well, we'll bring the hashtag fire Matt back. Got it. And we'll go from there. So slides, Brady, quiz, Matt. So today, these are the folks that are with us. You see that great-looking guy on the left? That's me. In addition, we have Ron E. Peck. Say hello, Ron. Hello, Ron. As always, the one person who makes our webinar numbers go up. Every time we put a picture up, LinkedIn followers triple. The number of views, quadruple. Not sure why it happens that way, but it seems to happen. Say hello, Jennifer McCormick. Hello. <laughs> You think if she found out that I was about to die, that she might just follow our lead and just do, hello, Jen. That's your last request. That's your dying last request. dying request. You think she'd finally do that for us? Wow. I think she'd finish with a hello, Ron, and it would be over. And because we made him do all the slides, we couldn't tell him to do all the slides and then not speak. Please welcome our very own Brady Bizarro. Say hello, Brady. Hello, Brady. Perfect. Folks, as you always know, follow us on LinkedIn. There are thousands of people that follow us. Every month they go up by a couple hundred. We're very excited. The latest news, stuff that you want to see, stuff you don't want to see, all of it's there. In addition to that, please subscribe to our iTunes podcast. Folks, our podcasts are getting really good. We just did one with Jen McCormick, but with all due respect, the one we did with Pat Santos, our producer, <laughs> is still – folks, I actually listened to Pat Santos' podcast, The Faces of Fia, right? That's right. I've listened to that podcast ten times. Every time I listen to it, I just think of him in that basement – playing Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> where he's the, what do you call himself? He's the Dungeon Master. The Dungeon Master, that's right? That's what he is. He, he, that's his job. That's like, his he's the Dungeon Master. This guy's tattooed across his back. Yeah. I, I think of myself, like, I just want to go and see this. I want to just, can, I, can anyone just walk in and say I want to join? Or is there a special, like, I think you have, process, to, ask, you have to ask his permission. He's it's the master. Role, it's the role play. Right, it's a role play thing. <laughs> We'll get into that next webinar, Ron. I'm Brady, about you and the role playing. Get to work on those slides. Well, this is, if you're wondering why maybe we're a little off our game today, it is possible, right? We're a little off. Somebody's not seeing the slides, by the way. I don't know how that's possible. Are you able to see the slides? Turn the uh, monitor on. Log out, right log out and walk back in, please, Stephanie. You're the only person that can't see the slides. I'm just messing around. Anyways, folks, we're a little off our game because we have a special guest here. And the shout-out is to Sarah Beth Jansen of McClone. She's an avid fan of our webinars and podcasts. Folks, when we told her that she would be the person we do a shout-out to, we didn't actually tell her to get on a plane, fly to our office, and come and <laughs> visit our webinar live. But that is exactly what she did. So, hold on. This move is over. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Sarah Beth Jensen. Jensen. Say hello, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. See? Nice. Well See? There you go. Thank you. That wasn't that hard, was it? All right. She follows the right lead. Anyway, it's great to have Sarah here in our office. I mean, you see this amazing studio, right? Isn't it gorgeous? This is the magic. This is where the magic happens. That's, that's what they all say. So, speaking of magic, these three people are magic here at FIA, the faces of FIA. First, Maddie Sesson, 
who's a director of uh, recovery services. She's a great employee, has been here for a long time. Have we done her uh, Face of Fear podcast yet? No. So she, I think she's been afraid to actually do it, so yes, that's sir. why. Next, guys, folks, Andrew Silverio is not that good looking. He's got the GQ poetry. Okay, he <laughs> looks, like, amazing. Like, he is, I mean, that is, this touch-up, what, what's going on here? That is not him. Every single one of his photos is perfect. I mean, look at this guy's face. That is not him. Jen. Like, I marry him. Like, I want to be this guy. This guy's amazing. Piercing. He's kind of- Andrew Silverio is a great attorney here. He's done everything in our organization from a compliance standpoint, just helping all of our clients whenever we can. He's a great addition. We're happy to have him. But, you know, I wish he looked that good when he comes in the office. And what's going on with him and those glasses? Like, what? how is he holding those? <laughs> Who decided to have to pose like that? Last but not least is Navi. I'm not even going to try to say her last name. It used to be Anderson. Yeah, right? it was much easier back then. Folks, you know that you've been at FIA too long when you literally call all of your employees by their maiden names? Because I don't know. You know she got married years ago, but yeah. I still remember her as being single. She is the person at FIA that I hate the most. Why? It's all about compliance. And I'm not very good at keeping compliant with things. I like to keep PHI around on my desk at all times. I have My computer's always on. My door's always open. My cabinets are never locked. So she keeps me in line, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, just be careful, Adam. I think the Russians are tuning in, and, you know, I know they've been trying to hack into your computer. Ron, I really think that our special guest, Sarah here, Sarah Beth, is actually affecting you today. She's sitting right next to you, and you're not 100% on your game right now. Yeah, Pretend she's, she's not here. She's trying, to, she's trying to look at my PHI. Pretend she, <laughs> That was good. Okay, now we're going to turn over to, I love this guy, we're going to turn it over to Matt for the questions. First question we have for today is... We're good? Here's the question. For the 2020 presidential election, do you believe healthcare, one, is the biggest issue by far, a major issue, but not the single biggest, less of an issue than people think? That is first. That's one. Next question. Washington, the state of Washington, correct, Ron? That's right. Has added a public option to their exchange, paying 160% of Medicare. 160% of Medicare. So just for you folks know, that is actually a lot less than other states that have gone gone this route are paying. Are you, one, excited to see the state forcing RBP, reference-based pricing, on providers? Two, worried that private plans won't be able to compete? Three, believe this will be a total flop, won't work, and they'll revert back to the carriers? Next question. And folks, we'll give you all the final answers, obviously, at the end of the webinar. We'll make sure to email to you. <clears throat> Next, how would you prefer the federal government address surprise balance billing? One, require out-of-network providers to accept in-network rates if the services are an in-network facility. Right. That's what I think should happen. Next. Don't influence the polls, right? <laughs> Identify third-party pricing benchmarks, meaning... Identify what the usual, reasonable customer price might be. A lot of people talking about the uh, the average in network rate and things like that. Exactly. And last but not least, arbitration, meaning it's almost like a baseball baseball style yeah, arbitration. Baseball arbitration. Where the facility and the patient or the plan both present two different numbers. One obviously higher number than the other, and the arbitrator picks one. There's no settlement in between. One number is picked. Yep. This is the one that it seems to me, Brady, you could chime in on this. The third one is the one that seems that the people are congressmen, et cetera, the government officials in D.C. are leaning yeah. towards this, correct? Yep, that's one of the for sure. And we'll have more on that in a couple of slides down the line. Right. What I like about the answer so far, it seems that most people agree with Ron and I, and not with Brady, that we should require that if I decide to go to an in-network facility and what the anesthesiologist happens to be out of network, that I should require that that hospital – still get paid the in-network rate for the anesthesiologist because how am I supposed to know if I go to an in-network facility there's an asterisk there except for the anesthesiologist. Are you right. taking responsibility for vendors providing services on your premises? What? Exactly. The last question. Sorry, Brady. Now, based on what you just heard, your plans moving forward include, now pick one, your plans moving forward, your personal plans. You're seeking to run for President of the United States as a Democratic nominee. There's only, what, how many of them are there now? Four. There's 24. So it'll be 25. So that's a big room deal. room for more. Second, 
getting into the drug manufacturing business. I know, Ron, you already have this in your basement. Yeah. <laughs> Correct? That's right. Third, moving to Washington State, meaning you're thinking about moving to Washington State because you're excited about joining their, pri their public exchange. Get me in. And only having to pay Medicare plus 160. Or last but not least, you are in Washington State, and you're like, you know what? I'm getting out of here. Yeah, me out. Because every facility is going to close down, and I'll have to go to Oregon? Oh, man. <laughs> Which we've been, I guess? Oh, well, Canada. Well, Canada's close, right? It's not too yeah. bad. Perfect. So we'll see what the answers are there, but I think so far it's gone pretty well, right? No problem, Matt? You're keeping your job for now? So we're good? Perfect. Folks, the next slide. This is the overview slide. What are we talking about today? As always, problem purpose process. Last month's most frequently asked questions to the group consulting, General Cormac obviously will handle that. We'll talk about the assault on Obamacare. We'll talk about the final rule on HRAs, surprise billing legislation, which ties into some of the questions that we had, as well as what's the matter with Washington State. We'll get into detail there. Last but not least, the healthcare 2020, the three camps, not the two camps, right. the three. Brady, I'm sure, will tell us what those are. So as always, People are saying they're not seeing the slides again, just an FYI. As always, what is the problem today? The problem today is that healthcare costs too much. What are we trying to do? Make it more affordable. And why? Because every single one of you and your clients and their employees deserves access to high quality, affordable healthcare. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Jennifer McCormick for last month's most frequently asked questions to the consulting division. All Say right. Hello. Hello. All right. Let's get the party started with some of these FAQs. All right. Let's start with what should plans consider when implementing a telemedicine benefit? So the major thing that people need to consider is what is the scope of care that is actually being provided by the telemedicine vendor or the program itself? Most often this rises to the level of actually being a benefit uh, that would be considered a group health plan on its own, so should not be offered as a standalone benefit, but should actually be incorporated into the health benefit plan itself as an added benefit. However, there can be some complications that could arise if the actual underlying general health plan is itself a high deductible health plan. So for example, with a high deductible health plan, we know that a employer or a plan design needs to make sure that anything except for preventive services are going to be subject to the deductible. But if you are allowing this telemedicine benefit and it's not subject to the deductible, then you're putting yourself in a position where you could sacrifice your tax-deferred status of the HSA that accompanies a high deductible health plan. So if you have a high deductible plan design, you're going to need to make sure that there are some ways that you can account for the cost of what those visits to the telemedicine uh, vendor of the program would be on a case-by-case -case basis. Hey, Jen, speaking of that, what percentage of our plans do you think have some type of telemedicine option in them? Most of the non-high deductible health plans do. I would say at least 50% of them have some sort of option. This is becoming a big thing in the industry. So 50% of the plans that we work with, that yeah. we write their plan documents, have telemedicine within them. Yep, it's a cheap option, right? So if you just want to call uh, and see if there's a way that you can hopefully get something taken care of, maybe over the phone, have a consultation, not having to wait months for an appointment, it seems like it could be a good option and it can save the plan money. When you say cheap, what is the price typically that we see? It's going to depend. It's usually charged as a PEPM. So just is it under $5, I'm yeah. assuming? Yeah. Okay, good. And it also depends on the scope of the services that are being provided by the, the vendor as well. Nice. Uh, the next one, can I extend coverage to a 1099 employee? This just kills me. So if you're a 1099, you're not an employee, right? That's the whole point of what a 1099 is. There's no such thing as a 1099 employee. So when people are asking these questions, we appreciate that there are employers out there who love their ICs, their 1099s so much that they want to include them within their benefit plan. That's awesome. But by doing so, you are going to put yourself in this situation where you're probably creating an accidental MIWA. And as we all know, there are a lot of complications or considerations with a MIWA that a general health plan doesn't necessarily meet or uh, have the obligations already in place to handle that. So you need to make sure that if you are extending coverage, that you're actually only extending coverage to an employee, not a 1099. And there could be some complications here that if you do accidentally, incidentally extend this coverage to someone who doesn't otherwise qualify as an employee, in addition to creating the MIWA, by offering this coverage that maybe you only intended to offer them for the three months they had a contract with your company, that now they're going to be subject to COBRA for 36 months. Oh, unintended consequence. And even more than that, maybe the 
facts and circumstances and realize that maybe this wasn't a 1099 situation. Maybe this is where the employment relationship has been established and there's other tax considerations and consequences that we're gonna need to worry about. And last, this is also a pretty exciting one. Do I have to count patient assistant amounts towards the patient's annual out-of-pocket maximum? So- Wait, did you say this is an exciting one? This is an exciting one. I just wanna make sure this is exciting. I that right. Woo. So let me tell you why. Let me tell you why this is exciting. So there has been a lot of discussion lately about these new programs, coupon assistance, patient assistance programs, and all of these programs are hoping to guide patients to options so that they can receive medications, prescription drugs in a cheaper fashion, maybe getting assistance with their copays. So we know right now under ACA there is a ceiling for what the out-of-pocket maximum must be, and there are certain items that must count towards out-of-pocket, such as essential health benefits, and what falls in that category are prescription drugs. So the way that a lot of these programs have been set up are possibly to exclude from the out-of-pocket maximum that patient assistance piece that they're receiving. So if they're getting a coupon for $150 for a $200 copay, that $150 is not counting towards the out-of-pocket, only that $50 is. So there's been a lot of gray area about exactly what it is that you can and cannot count towards it. But the new rules that are set to go into effect on January 1st, 2020, just six months away, uh, are actually allowing for this exception that says specifically that for manual manufacturer assistance amounts for specific brand name drugs, where there is a generic that is available, an equivalent that's available for that, that is not allowed to be, or you don't have to count that towards out-of-pocket maximum. So that's, that's the, huge. Right, that's the first official guidance that says that that is okay. This is a big benefit for self-funded employers, because now you're basically saying, hey, at the end of the day, we're not gonna allow you to count this, because that expense, yeah, sure, the patient isn't paying, but the employer is still paying the full bill right. on those branded drugs. I mean, that's, that's, right. that's huge. It's exciting, right? Told you. It's it exciting. is exciting. It is exciting. I have to admit, it is exciting. She got you. So she did. She got me. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, well, really quick, I think for next month's webinar, one of the questions we should talk about is that, is about this whole coupon program and how many of our clients and their plans are being affected in a negative way by such branded coupon programs. I mean, you see them on television all the time. From the patient's perspective, they're paying less or nothing for a branded drug, even though there's generic available, but the generic might be a $20 copay, but now because of this coupon, they have a zero copay. But that plan now is paying 30 grand instead of 500 for the same equivalent drug. Right, you're shifting the cost, you're not reducing the cost. Right. I think we should probably have a question on that next month, so Matt, don't forget that. Brady? Thanks, Adam. So yeah, I think, um, I beg to differ. I think my next few slides are pretty exciting, and maybe more <laughs> exciting than copay cards. But um, so why are our numbers all dropping now? <laughs> <laughs> Brady's all dropping. They're all going out the branded drugs right now. I have the pleasure of talking about one of the biggest laws that uh, impacts our industry, which of course is the Affordable Care Act. And I love finding this graphic of former President Obama like, sort of sweating. It's like, man, the pressure's really on. If you guys have been following our webinars for the past number of months, you might know that I sneak this graphic back in there from time to time. Every time something happens in the current administration that's putting pressure on the former one and his signature health care law. And that's what we have going on now. Back in January, we did a webinar called State of the ACA, and this is kind of like an update to that with respect to what's happening with the ACA now. Um, I think what's going on, and in reading tons of articles about this, is really the ACA is being remade. That's what's happening here. We talked about repeal and replace last year, maybe even the year before that. Really, though, it's been remade. The administration has realized that it lost the legislative battle in 2017 to effectively repeal the law because of the Senate didn't pass their replacement bill. And the administration's approach after that was to really death by a thousand cuts, right? To peck away at the ACA and pretty much launch an all out assault. And that's what's going on here with respect to actions taken by the administration. You have executive orders, you have administrative actions and court battles that have all really resulted in today, the ACA almost being remade. I put there Trump care, we're not quite there yet, but we're on the way. Executive orders, recall that in 2017, the administration passed um, three or it announced its plan to pass three big a trifecta, if you will, of, regu of regulatory actions that would transform the ACA. The first of them was to um, expand the use of association health plans. That was one. Two was to expand the use of these short-term plans, which um, that rule has also been final. The third one is a rule we're talking about later on today, which is the expanded use of HRAs, and that's going to have a pretty big impact on the employer-sponsored market. So those are the sort of three big orders that were released by the administration, the final one um, coming just this week. Administrative actions, we've seen agencies, HHS, IRS, 
all sort of cut back on enforcement of um, on employers who don't comply with the ACA. Obviously, individual mandate was repealed. That's a big deal. Um, they cut the budget for advertising and the individual exchanges, on and on and on. And then court battle. This is a biggie here because literally the ACA itself is under assault in a court battle. Um, but so are some fundamental components of the ACA, one of which Jen will talk about in a few slides about the contraceptive mandate. Um, and some of the rules that the administration has passed, they themselves are tangled up in the court. So you have a lot of things going on here, and I think it's worth diving into some detail about the really preeminent case that is challenging the existence of the very ACA itself, and that is the Texas versus United States case. It originally had a different name when it was in a lower court, but where we left, left off with this case, it had been appealed from a Texas federal court to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. And as a brief reminder what this case is about, it was brought by 20 states, mostly by Republican attorneys general, in February 2018. And it was brought not coincidentally after the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which eliminated the individual mandate in the ACA. Now, the reason that that's important is because it really set up a constitutional challenge to the ACA now that the individual mandate was essentially nullified by that legislation. So remember that the original challenge to the ACA, um, that it was unconstitutional, wasn't um, decided on the original topic, which was the Commerce Clause, it was decided that Congress could keep the ACA in place because of the taxing power. Well, now you have an argument being made by these plaintiffs that the tax has been removed, right? The individual mandate, the mandate to buy insurance, therefore the payment has been removed. No payment, no tax. And that's a pretty serious threat to the ACA. I would think it's, I think it's the most serious threat we've seen since the original case in 2012. The court decided in late December um, last year that they, it agrees that this mandate, individual mandate, can't be saved. It can't be severed from the rest of the ACA. It's so important that if that falls, according to the judge in Texas, the whole law has to go. And what was weird in this case is that, or I guess maybe not weird given the politics, the government didn't actually defend the ACA in court. Um, it actually agreed in part at first with that court's ruling. But remember that the judge could have issued an injunction against the whole law. He didn't. He stated his own ruling. Defendants appealed. And with the DOJ no longer defending the law, you had Democratic states attorneys general step in and the House of Representatives steps in to defend the ACA in court. Because now the DOJ, whereas before it was defending certain parts of the ACA, has taken the position as of March that the entire law should be struck down. That's a big deal. The government, which is representing this law, um, and by virtue of passing it, is now saying we don't think it should stay in place. So an update in this case is that the oral arguments in this case are set for July 8th. So I'm not sure what Adam will be doing that day, but I'll be watching. Are you, wait, I was going to say, you know, Brady, rather, I'll make an announcement. Sure. If you want to go to D.C. <laughs> the oral arguments. New Orleans. So that's where I got to go. It's the Fifth Circuit. If you want to go to New Orleans for this, I will take care of it. I will take him up on that. I think that's a good offer. <laughs> because I think, I think it'd be great. I must remember that federal court proceedings are not televised. It can't be. Right? Party 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 just go one day. I was going to say. Yeah. I'll take care of that. You know, they don't always have space for you, by the way. Right. You may yeah. end up standing outside, and then you're just going to have a couple of drinks and come home. Probably. Right. But this is going to be a big deal. This is the, the case. Both sides have presented their appellate briefs. The number of, um, I won't use the legal term, but basically side briefs that were filed by parties that have an interest in how this case gets decided, it's like all-time high. There's like... I don't even know how the judges are going to read all these things. So, Brady, great. as always, what's going to happen? <laughs> That's a great one. To put me out. <laughs> um, um, look, right. I think the Fifth Circuit uh, is notorious, just like the Texas District Court is, for siding with the administration. I think they could uphold this ch Texas judge's decision, which sets up, by the way, a very exciting decision. showdown right before the election. I mean, how much wow. more exciting Sliding can this get? All right, so I'm going to give like someone scripted this. It's right. Too perfect. It's, I'm going right. to give Brady two yeah. things. One, free trip to New Orleans for this. Second, if it goes to the Supreme Court, no, that's oh, it. Man, that's, wow. Wow. All right. Yeah, that I will attend. That'll be a big deal. So <laughs> that's what people expect to happen. The ACA itself will probably end up under or before the justice of the Supreme Court, which is basically a different court, as we've covered before. So that's unknown how that'll end. But we want to talk about another important um, part of the ACA that's been under threat. And for that, I want to turn it back over to Jen. Thanks. Attack number two, same judge. Uh-oh. Yeah. All right. So before we can dig into this one a little bit deeper, let's take a look back at what we're talking about. So what is this all about in the first place? We're talking about the contraceptive mandate. Oh, baby, right? So it's actually, uh, no baby. No, no baby. baby. That's pretty good. Oh, no baby. That's no, pretty good. Oh, no baby. Okay. So originally, under the ACA, there are preventive care requirements that uh, were extended for 
uh, women and for children and for all adults. And one of the women's preventive services was to require the coverage under a non-grandfather plan uh, at 100% for ADA approved birth control services. So this would be free. The point of this was to uh, help to control costs and to allow access to this care. And when this rule went into effect back if, if six or so years ago, uh, there were some concerns about these religious employers. So some of these employers had uh, objections, we'll say, to the provision of these services to their particular members. So as a result of that, they made a definition uh, under the regulations of what a religious employer would entail and would allow them to essentially opt out or have an accommodation or an exemption based on their uh, particular religious beliefs. But these rules were specific to these individuals and to these entities uh, as a result of the Hobby Lobby case that had a, that were for profit. <clears throat> And after that case had happened, we went a little bit further down the line, and then the Trump administration uh, issued an executive order that said that they were going to add upon these original exemptions and allow to allow some of these employers and allow some of these entities who weren't just objecting based on their religious beliefs, but also based on their moral convictions. They would also, in addition, have the opportunity to exempt out of the rules. Okay. Moral conviction. Whatever you think about Trump or no Trump, et cetera, isn't this a slippery slope? Like, I could say, well, you know what? I don't want to cover X because I have a moral conviction against this. I mean, basically, can't you get around anything with the ACA in regards to I'm a self-funded employee benefit plan, just like Hobby Lobby, right? Mm -hmm. I'm self-funded. It's a fee plan. I have a moral conviction about something. And therefore, I don't want to cover this because, hey, by the way, it's really expensive. Right. And I got a bunch of employees that might need it. Isn't that it setting is a up? slippery slope? And it's not only expanding it to based on the type of belief that you have, but the types of employers this would be eligible for. So it wasn't only for churches or for religious universities, but this is for publicly traded companies. Right. Yeah, so, well, we're not that big. Right. We're not publicly traded, well, right? A private, a private okay. employer like Hobby Lobby is a private employer. They're not right. a church. And right. what's interesting also, and to your point, Adam, is that it is ultimately about the cost. And the issue is that you recall, they basically said, well, the ACA requires you, someone, to pay for it. Right, so the the end user, the patient, right. doesn't yeah. have to pay for it. There has to be coverage. However, at the same time, the employer, the plan sponsor, does not have to pay for it because of the small conviction. As a result, who pays for it? And when that question was posed, they basically said, "Well, if you're self-funded, the, the administrator, the TPA pays for it." Right, but do we have any TPs? T if you're a TPA on the phone or a broker that would know this, I mean, on the not on the phone, the webinar, let us know that if you ever actually have to pay for contraceptives before because one of your plans decided that they were morally objected to it whatever the situation might be but you know for the case of hobby lobby it was a moral belief right i mean that's sure they're a religious company oh yeah owners. they're on record definitely that way. right so it wasn't about the money because actually if you think about it at the end of the day from a cost standpoint it's cheaper to pay for a contraceptive than it would be to pay for delivering babies right let's be honest here sure. so it wasn't about money but any other employer could say it's for a moral conviction but really it's about dollars and cents right how would you know at the end of the day yeah, and the other thing about this, too, is that as these exemptions and accommodation processes were going into effect, it has a big impact because you specifically need to notify people right at this change because this is a reduction of coverage. So making sure that you're modifying your plan language. And then if you, as an employee of this publicly traded company, Hobby Lobby, who didn't have these same beliefs, that puts you in a bad spot because right. now you no longer have access to coverage. So as a result of this expanded exemption, there were some judges, two judges, one in California, and then more notably, the one in California, or in Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia, that issued a nationwide injunction that was prohibiting this from going into effect to expand this moral conviction uh, additional exemption. Can I add real quick that a nationwide injunction is a big deal. I will, I'll spare you the details, but you have to really identify a class of people who are affected nationwide, and it's pretty rare for a court to do this. Usually you see injunctions that are issues that mm -hmm. limit it to a certain region or a certain type of person. This is nationwide, so right. it's a big deal. So essentially this was stopping the uh, rule from going into effect, the expanded rule, while these legal challenges were still going on. So we've actually had a client respond. One of, one of, one of our uh, viewers responded and said they had a client who's no longer a client where they actually paid for the contraceptives. Interesting. Right, and this was kind of exciting because this happened, these rules went into place or these decisions were issued on the day that the rule was supposed to go into effect. So that left a lot of people kind of up in arms thinking they had to make a change, and they didn't. What's next? All right. Wait, you're still going, Jen? Still going. What's going on today? Still going. I guess Brady figured it out. Like, just have Jen talk, and we'll be fine. That's yeah. it. Good to know. Jen? 
So most recently, about a week or so ago, there was our favorite judge, my favorite judge, Mr. Reed. Um, he had uh, decided to. Good old, he's not listening. Well, it's my son's name, so it's a good name. It's a good name. Um, so anyways, there was this class action that is essentially there are two classes. There's individuals and their employers. And the I'll get to the punchline here. Essentially, uh, this judge, O'Connor, is permanently enjoining the government from actually expanding these classes. So right now there are these classes, whether you fall in the individuals or in the entities category, that you are going to be allowed to exempt or accommodate certain people based on their moral convictions. And one of the things that was kind of interesting about this case is that they were saying that going through this accommodations process itself, in itself, going through the accommodation process by having to provide the notification of your beliefs, that alone was a religious exercise in violation of the Religious Freedom Act. So as a result of that, um, the other issue I think that was kind of interesting as part of this case before I move on is that one of the reasons that they decided not to pursue this is because the federal government was no longer defending their position on this anymore. So if there's no one to say or to uh, have the opposite opinion, why are you going to continue to fight it? So that leaves us right now with no one left to appeal or no one left to object to this. But I don't think that this is the end of the story. I think that there is going to be some additional follow-up, some additional litigation when people and employees are actually being affected on about this rule. And like the Texas case, I think you'll have someone intervene, whether it's a Democratic attorney general or the House representative, someone with standing to appeal. But as of yet, there's no clear party to do that. All right, 1557. So... This was originally issued in May, but there was some recent uh, finalization of this uh, recently in June. So what is happening here? So this has been kind of an ongoing back and forth. Will we, won't we? What is it that we need to do? As a background, about 1557, as it matters for the purposes of what we're talking about today, 1557 is the regulation uh, that is intended to build upon existing federal rights laws. That is intended to protect certain individuals from discrimination when it comes to health care and the ACA exchanges. So based on this rule under 1557, there was an expanded definition of on the basis of sex. And within that definition, it included certain categories like gender identity and termination of pregnancy. And with that definition, it meant that employers that were subject to 1557 were not permitted to categorically exclude things items, benefits, sex reassignment surgery, hormones, counseling, for example, uh, for those particular individuals. So that meant employers that were subject to 1557 because of this expanded definition of on the basis of sex needed to make certain modifications to their plan to potentially add this coverage. So to cover things that normally wouldn't be covered. Right. So with this new rule, this new proposed regulation, they have decided to roll back the actual definition of on the basis of sex. And if they eliminate the definition of on the basis of sex, right. that means that gender identity and stereo gender stereotyping and termination of pregnancy will no longer fall within those protected classes. So that means all of those benefits that we had added into there may not necessarily be required to have. It doesn't mean that you have to pull them back. It just means that if- It means that if you're an employer that offers these benefits now because you have to, going forward potentially, you would no longer have to offer these benefits. Right. Got it. Right. So outside of the 1557 issue, this still is a category of individuals where there could be employment-based litigation. So just because 1557 doesn't require you to add coverage, it doesn't mean that individually an employee through the EEOC maybe could file litigation saying that you were discriminated against as an employee. But this could be a big deal. This could be a big deal. All right. So any idea when we'll have some more information on this? All right. Thank Bring you. It back to you. Ron, do you get to talk at all? I love how Brady never gives you Brady never gives you slides. He's jealous. <laughs> he has he never one. gives you any slides. You know what? Have I'm, you talked yet? I'm I'm resting my voice for the last slide. <laughs> Does he get a slide? Does he get a goodbye slide? Don't worry. He's, he's in the bullpen right now. It'll okay. be okay. He's getting ready. All right. It'll, it'll be a surprise. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, So another big uh, issue here is that um, it's going to impact our industry. I, I'm actually surprised. I, this is relatively new, so I expect to, be able to hear a lot more about this this rule on, on on HRAs. So when was it released? It was just released a couple of days ago. Thankfully, I had time to edit in the slides. It's that important. Um, it goes into effect January 1st, 2020. What does it do? So a quick stack up for a second and remind people what HRAs are, in case you may be wondering or you're embarrassed to ask. So these are account-based plans. They're employer-funded on a pre-tax basis. Um, they're used to reimburse certain medical expenses that the IRS will identify as qualifying. 
right? But the HRA account-based plan must be integrated with another group health plan because as it stands by itself, it doesn't satisfy the ACA's requirements. So that's historically been the sort of structure of how HRAs work. This final rule, um, which was issued, again, recently and was one of the three in the trifecta I mentioned earlier, um, would significantly expand the use of HRAs because it's going to create and allow something called an individual coverage HRA. So basically, it's going to allow the employer to use those HRA funds to pay for premiums of an employee who is in the individual market on an individual plan. So it's basically allowing an HRA account-based plan to be integrated with an individual medical plan. That's a huge deal. That's a big deal. The goal of that, by the way, is to expand, or at least administration's position, is to expand the use of HRAs, give people more choices, give employers more choices, employees more, cho more choices. I think though there's, there's some concern for our industry about why that might be bad. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. But real quick, one other thing to know here in this rule is it also creates something called accepted benefit HRAs. And this just means that it'll allow the funds in the HRA to be used for things like vision coverage, dental coverage, long-term care coverage. So basically other benefits that you previously couldn't use HRA money for. So that seems all well and good. And just note that there's some guardrails here. So just like with the HRA integration with the group health plan, if you're going to offer an individual HRA, you've got to do so on the same terms to all individuals in a certain class. Be careful about discrimination there. Um, the contributions have to be equal for everyone in the class. But of course, you can vary them by age and numbers. That's the same kind of concerns that they had for the group health plan integration piece. And employers can contribute as much or as little as they want to. But I think this is a big deal and going to have uh, a big impact on our industry and could be disruptive because um, based on CBO estimates, Congressional Budget Office estimates, it's expected that 800,000 businesses, now admittedly they're mostly smaller businesses, but they are likely to see this as a, as a way to get their employees to basically go on the individual exchange and pick an individual insurance plan because now they can use HRA money to help reimburse the premiums for employees who select those plans. That means they're not using employer-sponsored coverage plans, so less employer plans, I think, would be the result here. Um, that could be a big deal. So we'll see how the industry reacts, how these employers react, but that's going to steer people away from um, employer insurance and toward the individual market. So I think this could potentially be, if not a threat, certainly a disruption to employer-sponsored insurance and certainly self-funding because, again, employers can just pay reimbursed premiums, which is previously disallowed. By the way, one of the reasons it was disallowed is because of the concern, which now exists, about employee dumping and discrimination. So if you have an employee on your plan who incurs high medical bills, right, who has a chronic condition, or frankly, you just want to get off your plan, now suddenly, if, as long as you're not being discriminatory, you can send them to the exchanges and pay for their premium on individual uh, exchanges, and you couldn't do that before. So that's huge. That's I mean, you think about that. If you have a person who potentially might be lasered on the plan, yep. or someone that just costs a lot of money on the plan, right? Mm -hmm. Just an employee that just gets sick all the time. This would be an obvious option, right? Yeah, no, it totally would. And I think, again, we'll have to see how the employers react, but 800,000 employers could send their employees off their employer plans into the individual market. Uh, that's a big deal. I think we should keep an eye on that. So what do we know more about this? Well, right? the impact, we'll have to wait and see, but the rules, the rule goes into effect on January 1st, 2020. So that's when we should start seeing if employers are going to start steering people away from our industry and into the individual market. For our clients. Do you want to think from a plan design standpoint, change any language in the this plan? This will require a separate template in order yeah. to have this. They'll have to have a, a special, special document. Yep. So there's more money for fee to make here. <laughs> right. Unbelievable. So, HRA individual plan. Yeah. Just want to make sure we're up for the record. Right. It's 40 minutes in. Ron, get the slide. That's it. Wow. Brady. He gets the best ones. Though. I know you didn't like them, but this is serious. Mark, mark your calendar. So actually, on that last one also, Brady, I'd be curious to see if there is that kind of employee dumping to Adam's point of high dollar uh, individuals, right. what that's going to do to those individual policies to the carriers that are basically funding those. Oh yeah, I mean the rates would skyrocket because you would of think, adverse right? collection. So if anything, it's just a short term. Yeah, but if you're the employer or their broker, what do you care? Yeah, seriously. That's I mean, you're worried about this year, right? I mean, right. every broker out there is thinking, what, what, how is this? I want to look good this year. Yep. If I could dump two or three employees onto this other exchange, Great for the plan. Yeah, great when, for it goes, me. when it goes bankrupt two years from now, they could just come back then. Right. There you go. So speaking of. Uh, Surprise, it's, it's Ron. Uh, let's talk about surprise balance billing. So very quickly, what is surprise balance billing? For those of you who don't know, surprise balance billing is not all balance billing. It's just a balance bill when a patient receives care at an in-network facility, but from an out-of-network provider, and they're balance billed the difference between what the plan pays and what the provider charge is, 
or alternatively, the patient is treated at an ad hoc network provider in an emergency situation where they didn't get to pick or choose their provider. And so those are the two general scenarios where you see surprise balance billing taking place. And as you can imagine, most people will agree that if a person is being balance billed in one of those scenarios, it's not really fair. They didn't pick an out-of-network provider, and in some instances, they actually did the research and tried to select an in-network provider. And because everybody inherently feels like there's just something unfair about this, dealing with this problem is a bipartisan or an opportunity for a bipartisan win. And as everybody knows, uh, when there's a lot of infighting in Congress and it's not looking so good from an outside perspective uh, because it looks like there are children bickering, they're always looking for opportunities to get those uh, layups, those bipartisan wins, and this is one of them. Um, <clears throat> so some of the ideas that they're tossing around, and we've listed the three main options here. The first one is the one that Adam and I tend to, uh, tend to get behind, which is this idea of the contractor subcontractor where if I'm an in-network facility and I allow an out-of-network provider to operate out of my facility, I'm almost like a contractor. That provider is a subcontractor. If they don't agree to the terms that I've agreed to with my client, that's between me and the subcontractor. I shouldn't sort of back away and say, hey, you guys figure it out. And we talked about this before. Option one is the biggest no-brainer on earth. It seems that way. It does seem that way. It, it seems the fairest way. I mean, it's it's pretty simple. If I go to a hospital and they're in network, if I'm if I as long as I'm still there, I need to leave the hospital and I come back. If I walk into some places in network, shouldn't everything in there be in network? I don't understand how this is an issue. Well, you put a lot of the responsibility and potential cost, the balance between the in network rapers with the on the provider. Right, but the so provider can just turn to their anesthesiologist. Go, hey, I know that you know you expect me paid X Y Z, but if you want to offer your services at this facility, you got to play by the same rules sure. we do. But that's why, that hard. that's why the pushback's coming from the provider side, because it's either cost or it. effort on their part. I get it. Um, another option that, you know, at least Congress hopes could uh, basically appease everybody uh, rather than, you know, this will appease nobody. Like, <laughs> nobody is the idea of arbitration. Okay, and we talked a little bit about baseball arbitration. So a lot of people hear arbitration and they think some wise Solomon is going to come in and come up with a fair price that everybody can live with. They're not thrilled, but they're not uh, unhappy either. That's not what this is. Baseball arbitration, the two sides of the dispute come in, each with their own price, and the arbitrator picks one or the other. There is no middle ground. No middle ground. And one of the big issues here is that, okay, so the arbitrator is presented with two numbers, but what are the rules? What are the rules that the arbitrator has to abide by when deciding which of those two numbers to pick? If the rule is you go with the number closest to the provider's charge master, the provider's going to win every time. And who are these arbitrators? Like, who are these How are they qualified? Are they from the hospital world? Are they from the insurance world? I mean, are they patient advocates? I mean, all this stuff here on this second option seems way much more work. People say that it's easier. I think it's harder. I mean, Who's setting up these meetings? Where are they taking place? Are they taking place at the hospital? I mean, to me, option one still blows this number two one away just from an optics standpoint and the ease of implementation. So what's interesting, and we'll talk a little bit more about arbitration when we talk about Texas and New York in particular, but Adam, you've actually gotten it spot on well, I because, do, Rod. because it's so unreasonable and so costly, it's basically more of a, a threat than an actual process. And it results in these uh, payers and payees negotiating outside of arbitration. Ron, think about it. If you're a hospital, you want option two. Why? You're expecting the other side not to even show up. That's it. Think about it. Anyone here has been to court, right? You go to a small claims court or you go to just any district court, and you'll see that hack attorney. I call them hack attorneys. They're always the attorneys that like literally finish the, end, the lower end of the class, right? Who are there just doing default judgments, right? So and the other side never family. shows up. You're there with right. a stack, and they go... Jenny Smith, approved. Jenny McCormick, approved. are you here? Approved. No, right. no Jenny McCormick, nope, she's not here. Ron Tech, you here? No. And it's just default judges against all the defendants. Yep. To me, I think that's what they're looking at this as. Like, oh, well, the other side didn't show up, so hospital, you're going to get the price that you wanted. Rubber stamp. So number three, which, you know, on its face sounds, oh, well, this is such a fair compromise between the two other options, it, it has so many inherent issues. This is the idea that you set a price cap, all right, this objectively fair price cap. And that sounds great, right? We could all agree, oh, an objectively fair price that you have to accept this payment in full if you're the payee and that you have to pay if you're the payer. What a great idea. That begs the question, okay, what's the objective price based on? And they've 
more or less said, let's use the average network rate. The problem with this, and there's a number of them, but right off the bat is the fact that if you're looking just at what causes surprise balance billings, specialists and emergency care, those claims are notoriously high. Network discounts are notoriously low, especially wrap discounts. So they're skewing the numbers. Right. So you're not looking at the average discount across all claims. You're looking at the average discount for this type of care, which you're going to end up paying through the nose if that's the number that you're using. So and let's be so honest, right? Can play with and let's be numbers. honest. I can go to 25, I can go to 30 different review organizations, 30 different claim negotiation companies, and they'll give me 30 different prices for what a usable, reasonable, reasonable customer price is. There's no objective standpoint as to what is a reasonable price. Right. To and that's the problem is that when you're using a network rate as the sort of the objective Even price network point, rates differ. The problem is uh, uh, those who are making these decisions right now and they view this option as the best option, I don't think they necessarily understand the way the network even works. They think that a negotiated price, it's the same as when you purchase a car, that you go and you say, this is the price I'm willing to pay for this car. They don't understand that the way this is actually being done with the Toyota dealership, and the dealership starts off with a price on a $30,000 Camry at $150,000, and that you're negotiating the price down, not that you're agreeing on a fair price from the ground up. And because they don't understand that's the way these discounts are, are negotiated, you're not negotiating a price. You're negotiating a discount. That inherent lack of understanding as far as how these networks work is why I don't think they understand the opportunity to skew these numbers and as a result, screw up this potential, what otherwise would have been a good idea, that being an objectively fair price. We need you on that committee, Ron, I think. I, you know what? I'm, I'm a busy guy. I, you know, when you go to the Supreme Court, I'll go with you and uh, I'll spend some time doing in the meantime. So quickly, uh, I, you know, I mentioned before that we'll talk about how arbitration is actually shaped out for a couple states that have been doing it for a while, that being specifically Texas and New York. Um, without going into too much detail, Texas, again, forcing the arbitration, uh, a lot of things that I don't think those who come up with these rules understand is that time is so important as well. If I'm a self-funded benefit plan, right, it's not just about, well, what am I paying? It's also, when am I paying? Because if it's being drawn, uh, dragged out for arbitration, what does that do to my discount? What does that do to stop loss, right? If stop loss is waiting on me to submit these claims and I'm waiting on arbitration to complete, it's gumming up the entire system. Here's the funny thing about the Texas proposal, right? And I know we can move on to New York right after this one. It creates a state regulatory authority over the arbitration process. I never thought of Texas as a place that You'd want more government control. You're literally creating another, another governmental entity, another department, whose sole job it is is to handle arbitration process for disputes between providers and insurers. Right? I, it's madness. I'm it's, lo lions government. lions Texas, playing with lands. I can see I if this was a Massachusetts proposal. Like here, this yeah. would be great. Yeah. But I'm surprised that this is a text proposal. How does the New York one differ, right? So New York, uh, same, same, more or less the same thing. What they've noticed in New York, though, is because it's voluntary, right? What they've actually discovered is that very, very few disputes are appearing before an arbitrator. Uh, actually, looking at the numbers, right, a couple of things, right? First of all, they pointed out that between 2013, before the bill was passed, 20% of these out-of-network claims were in dispute. Now, only 6%. Are appearing before there the six percent of these balance bills are occurring because they're being resolved by the payer, the plan, and the provider before it ever gets balance billed to the patient and before it ever goes to arbitration. And a lot of uh, those who support this idea of arbitration, they actually this is a source of pride for them. The fact that arbitration is expensive, there's always a chance they're going to lose, and as a result, if the provider is willing to accept an amount that you as the payer feel is equal to or less than what you would spend in arbitration, you're just going to pay it. The problem is that number is not necessarily a fair number. If I'm a provider and I'm charging $100,000 for something that's objectively fair, should only be 1000 even if it's only a 50-50 chance you're going to have to pay me the 100000 a 50% chance at paying 100000 is worth, based on math, Fifty thousand, right? <laughs> Plus, it's a. Let's you should say, ask Jen to share. Yeah, that, what's fifty? By the way. Now, let's say the price. If you lose in arbitration, you also have to pay for the arbitration. That's let's say another five hundred dollars. So fifty fifty chance you lose. Tack on another two fifty. So if I'm the provider, I tell you, hey, I'll take thirty thousand. That's still a lot more than the one thousand dollar fair price. 
but it's less than the risk of taking arbitration. You just notice that Ron starts shaking when he gets really into it. Well, you know. Like he's shaking the entire table. That's why. Is that why you minimize his slides? You're worried about a heart attack here? <laughs> it's for my own health. Ron, what's going on in Washington State? We talked about Oh, man. Let's take a time. Let's talk about Washington. So this is another one that's stuck in my cross. <laughs> if you think I'm going to calm down, they may be on the other side of the country, but I feel like it's my next door neighbor. Um, so Washington has basically passed now a, a public option that's going to be added to their exchange. So you have a bunch of private health plans, uh, health insurance policies on this exchange, and then one public exchange uh, plan. So let's say you're a uh, person, you're shopping on this exchange, you're purchasing your policy, you're looking, you're comparing the benefits. Maybe year one, you select one of the private plans. Great. But over time, what's going to happen is the price differential between a private plan and this plan is going to get so big that you would have to be a fool not to pick the public plan. Why? Because they're paying Medicare plus 60% to Well, private. you could just do a regular reference-based pricing plan in Washington as a private employer and pay less than that, too. Oh, but then you're going to be having all your employees or patients balance bills. Maybe. I mean, this to me seems really – I'm captivated to know what's going to happen here. To me, I'm, I'm amazed by this. It, this is a big deal, uh, especially with the reimbursement rate being, quote, unquote, so low. Again, right. it's still 60% more than what they would get under Medicare, but it's still Compared, lower yeah. compared, comparatively to what you see right I now on the public a team. lot of uh, people and entities in this, in this industry have said that in order to compete with this plan, the only way you can compete is to do Medicare Plus and offer something that's better than them as well. But on the flip side, I'm curious to see, and you mentioned this before, what is this going to do to the providers? What is this going to do to access? Um, are they going to shift the cost, the supposed loss they suffer by taking Medicare Plus 60? onto the private payers, speeding up the difference between the two when it comes to comparison shopping. And the last thing I'll say, and this really makes me nuts, um, and I've mentioned it before, uh, Democratic State Representative Eileen Cody mentioned that uh, this idea of Medicare plus 60% setting uh, payable rates at a percent of Medicare, it's the first, quote, it's the first time anybody has put a rate cap on a plan and tried to make sure those people who are buying insurance don't have to pay so much. Our own John Jablon, who's been dealing with balanced billing on reference-based pricing <laughs> and Medicare-based pricing plans for a decade, has apparently not been doing anything. We have been paying him to sit there and play games on his computer well, because there's never actually been a reference-based pricing plan. Wow. Never. All right, let's turn it back over to Ms. McCormick. You talk about the pain yeah. leave. Why do they give all the contraceptives, the family ones? Why do they always go to Jen? I can take a hint. What is that? Everything goes to family goes to Jen. Anything that is going to shake the table goes to Ron, and all the politics goes to Brady. And I get no slides because I think you guys assume me just jumping in on your slides. More or less. Thing. <laughs> Jen, quick update. We've only got five minutes. All right. So real quick, all we need to know is that Connecticut is the next state in line that has added the paid family leave option for um, individuals, for employees. The notable differences here is that this is actually a pretty generous policy, and they'll allow for 12 weeks of paid coverage. Uh, and this is not set to take effect until 2022, with the contributions from employees and employers starting uh, in 2021. So we'll actually see in Massachusetts ourselves what the impact is, and I'm sure that Connecticut will actually borrow from what Massachusetts does. So you said seven states now offer it, right? Right. By 2022, how many states do you think will be offering it? At least half. I think this At is, least half. Yeah, I think this is going to become a, a thing that everyone else is doing. It's a popular benefit, and maybe it's going to attract new residents. So, so how is this going to affect self-funded employers? What do they have to do in their plan design changes, et cetera? So quickly, they're just going to have to make sure they update their employee handbook to allow for this uh, intended paid leave, and also their plan documents to not only allow for the leave, but to extend the coverage. Great job. Before, Brady, you get going, all, we have, we're getting comments. People are actually saying they can't find us on LinkedIn. I don't know how that's even possible. You're not looking, it's not P on FIA group, it's PHIA. Or you can just look up Ron Peck, Adam Russo, or Brady Bizarro, or Jim McCormick, and you'll find us. In addition, folks, all of our slides will be sent to you. They'll all be made available on our website. All the past webinars are on our website, and you can register going forward to be on our mailing list on our website as well, as well on www. No one says that anymore. <laughs> Brady, thanks, Adam. So this is want to wrap up quickly with these last three slides about as people may know, next week is the start of the Democratic primary debates. I'm super excited to watch. <laughs> There's 
25 <laughs> I'm not paying for you to go there. He's got a circle on I'm going to I'm ending it right now. Well, look, this is going to be a big deal. Healthcare is 2020. <laughs> look at the polling. We're all about polls today. Here's one from Kaiser Family Foundation. What is the most important issue that they want to hear about? Healthcare. Today? Of course, it's healthcare. So people who said it wasn't at the earlier question were wrong. And the second one is issues affecting Jim McCormick's life. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we'll all drown from the melting polar ice caps, but at least we can talk about healthcare. And I want to just mention the three camps that the candidates fall on. I took a long time finding these great graphics, by the way. Yeah, this is beautiful. Don't ask me. I can tell you after the I'll name every one of these people out there. I don't have time right now. No one cares. You know, <laughs> he has their baseball cards and everything. Right. So, look, there's the Medicare for all people, which is people say, look, health care is a human right. Um, the government should provide to everyone regardless of their ability to pay. This would replace the private insurance market. There's a bill introduced by Senator Bernie Sanders about Medicare for all. Everyone's being asked about it. There's different forms of Medicare for some. Um, but just know that this is essentially where the government is the payer, right? They're in the middle. Instead of private insurance, they're paying for treatment of providers. I think unlikely to happen, but it's a huge discussion point. So is the public option. This is kind of like the less controversial um, option. The other camp here, we have people. It's like, almost like Obamacare. Yeah, yes. Well, um, what well, Obamacare wanted to include originally, which is right. the public option. This is Washington State. That's why I got the graphic there. But got it. Our own <laughs> senator there, Elizabeth Warren, she's in that camp, and others that are big time there. The government should provide health care um, and provide an option. Who knows what they'll have the reimbursement rate at, maybe 160. But that seems to me less controversial. And then you have here, all by themselves, sad, you know, Joe Biden there, with the Fix the Affordable Care Act. Because at this point, I feel like- A lot the, of diversity on this part. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the, uh, the, the, the country is mostly, over, it's the party, the Democratic Party, has shifted really away from fixing the ACA. And I think if you, in, this is a takeaway, combine the fact that the so few candidates that are willing to revise and, re, and fix the ACA with the fact that on the other side of the aisle, you have court battles that are attacking it left and right, I'm not sure it's going to survive. And we're going to find out um, in ne next year when there's a Supreme Court case where the very law itself is challenged. Wow. Folks, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Our next webinar, it's free, folks. It's free. July 23rd, 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Hopefully by then we'll have temperatures in the 70s. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to give a special shout-out again to Sarah Beth Jensen. I hope you enjoyed your live in-studio audience. Very much so. On behalf of Brady Bizarro, Jen McCormick, the Ron Peck, and your humbled host, Adam Russo, Thank you so much for joining us here today at the FIA Group. See you next month.